Every new year, I send out a survey in January to my email list, and I ask for what the teachers on my list, what their biggest struggles are in the classroom. And then I use their responses to guide what types of podcasts I plan. And I that's how I make all my podcast episode <laughs> ideas for literally the rest of the year. And one of the resounding topics that came up over and over in the hundreds of responses I got to this year's survey back in January was teachers struggling with a lack of resilience in their students. And veteran teachers specifically, because I always ask in my survey how long you've been teaching just for context, the veteran teachers specifically really pointed out how much they've seen a shift in resilience in the last four years post-COVID, post-pandemic. And now I need to start off this podcast by saying I am not an expert in post-pandemic teaching. I'm not even qualified to be in the rookie category for post-pandemic teaching because I have not been in the classroom full-time post-pandemic. And so this is why anytime you guys have questions about something that's really specific to this time frame, I try to bring in other teachers who have experience on the front lines these past few years. Like back in episode 89, when I brought on Casey O'Hearn and he talked all about classroom management and how his classroom management is really unique post-pandemic. And so I've known in the back of my mind that y'all needed this episode about resilience. I wasn't trying to ignore it. You know, I've had my eyes and my ears open looking out for other people to come on and speak about this. So if you feel like you are that person, like you're like, I've got this. I've got stuff to say about building resilience in students post-pandemic, then by all means, send me your pitch as to why you should be my next podcast guest on this topic. You can email me. Rebecca at it's not rocket science classroom.com. But here's what's kind of funny. So I've been putting this off until I could find the right person. But ironically, since I did that series back in June of things I've learned from parenting and how they apply to teaching, I now see so many correlations every single day in what I'm doing with my kids in my house and how it can correlate to teaching. And I kid you not, I'm gonna lose some of you here, but I want you to stick with me. Back in July, when I potty trained our youngest, okay, so this is only the third time I've ever potty trained, I only got three kids, but I did it for the third and final time, as much as you can control that. For the third and final time I potty trained, I just kept thinking the whole time I was doing it that I'm building resilience in my two-year-old exactly how I would do this with a group of high schoolers. It's the exact same process. All you're doing in potty training is teaching them a new skill that they've never thought to do before. And you're having to train them in resilience so that they will keep going even when it's hard and scary and something totally new to them. And so today I am literally going to share with you how to build resilience in your post-pandemic students alongside how I potty trained our youngest. Okay, that's gonna be the analogy for this entire episode. So I know this sounds insane, especially if you do not have young children. You're like, I do not wanna hear this, but please hear me out. I think the analogy is super clear. And here's the thing. If you listen to this and you think it's trash advice and you have something better to offer, I'm not kidding. Please email me, please reach out. Prove to me that you've got you know some good stuff to say on this, and I would be thrilled to interview on the podcast. Y'all know I love guests if, as long as I get the right guests, and I just love when I get the right guests. So, but for now, you guys are stuck with me. So let's get into this episode about building resilience in apathetic post-pandemic students. This is Secondary Science Simplified, a podcast for secondary science teachers who want to engage their students and simplify their lives. I'm Rebecca Joyner from It's Not Rocket Science. As a high school science teacher turned curriculum writer, I am passionate about helping other science teachers love their jobs, serve their students, and do it all in only 40 hours a week. Are you ready to rock the time you spend in your classroom and actually have a life outside of it? You are in the right place, teacher friend. Let's get to today's episode. So 
So like I said at the top of this episode, I think the analogy between potty training and building resilience in high schoolers is just so spot on. I mean, think about it. Think about the definition of resilience. Merriam-Webster defines resilience as an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. And that is like what you do in potty training. You're basically teaching your kids this brand new skill. You're opening their eyes to the fact that things come out of their body and they can control where they place those things and the timing with which they do it. And in doing that, they are going to mess up so much, okay? They are going to easily experience misfortune And it's our job during this learning process of them learning this new skill to equip them to have resilience so that they can recover from it and adjust and move forward in progress and not be totally defeated or, you know, turn on you and, you know, go totally against you and lash out in their struggles to learn this new skill. And we see that in two-year-olds like we see it in, you know, 16-year-olds in terms of when they come to -to head-to-head with an obstacle, how will they approach it? How will they handle it? And so that's what we're going to walk through. I'm going to share basically like five or six kind of pieces of the process that I used, and I'll give the explanation of how it worked with potty training, and then I'll give the explanation of how it worked... um, (laughs) how I believe it would work with your students in the classroom. Sorry, I'm laughing. I just like, I'm picturing some of you listening to this in your car on the way to work and you're like, what did I get myself into? But I just want you to hang with me, okay? All right. So first and foremost, I think the most important thing with resilience is clear expectations and consistent reinforcement. I think sometimes the frustration that leads to a lack of resilience, a lack of ability to recover or adjust easily, is that students feel like they are trying to hit a moving target and or they don't even know where the target is. And I think that's chaotic and I think it can lead to defeatism. So I think one of the first and foremost things we need to do for our students if we want them to be resilient and to be willing to try hard things and keep going when they mess up is to be very clear on what we expect and then consistently reinforce that expectation by communicating it over and over. Basically, we've got to hold the line, if you will. Y'all know me. I don't do anything without an instruction manual. Your girl loves to read an instruction manual. And so I, of course, have a potty training book that I like that I have read and done for all three of my children. And, you know, with everything, you got to take and leave some parenting stuff. Parenting advice is so hot. Like I'm sure some of you are disturbed that I even potty train my kids at two. You think that's way too young, you know? So there's a lot of opinions about parenting stuff. So I'm not saying I fully endorse this book, but one of the things I really, really take away from it is she's like that your child's success in potty training is like entirely dependent on how committed you are as the parent to basically hold the line. Like if you're gonna do this, you need to do this. If you waver, they're gonna smell that wavering on you. If you show them that you don't believe they can do it, they're gonna live into that. And I just think that's so true. My friends who it's taken nine months, a year, a year and a half for them to like feel like their kid is fully potty trained, I feel like it's because they've gotten tired. And so you know, they've thrown on the diaper for the day or they're running errands and they don't want to have to stop and take them potty. So they just put them in a pull up for the errands. And again, to each their own, you have to do your own thing. But I think the key to building this new skill and the resiliency to move forward, even when you mess up in learning this new skill is to be clear and consistently reinforce. And it's very, very matter of fact, we're going to keep this non-emotional. Y'all know how I feel about that. So we just straight up tell them. I also think all like parenting transitions work best if you just do them cold turkey. When we dropped the swaddle or when we switched from bottles to sippy cups or we switched from formula to whole milk, I didn't do like a have situation or like we get the bottle at night, but sippy cup during the day. I just, one day I throw out the bottles and I say, here's your sippy cup. This is your only option. Okay. That's kind of the way that I handle parenting stuff. And that's what we do with diapers. I put all the diapers in a box I donated it to our our church nursery, and I said to my two-year-old, 
you are a big boy now and I know that you can pee and poop on the potty. So we are going to use the potty now. We are not going to use diapers. Mommy's going to show you how to do it. And then as we walk through the process each day, I mean, especially in the beginning, most of the bodily fluids are going on the floor because he doesn't even know stuff comes out of his body. It's it's a phenomena for him to be like, wow, things are coming out here because it's all just been in a diaper before. But when things come out, I'm not getting frustrated. I'm not saying like, you messed up, you had an accident. I'm saying, oh, your pee went on the floor, pee goes in the potty. And I'm just reiterating that expectation over and over. That's what I want you to do with your students as well. Whatever it is, if you're not gonna accept late work, if they are not allowed to talk during their bell ringer, if you know they have to be seated until the bell rings, I'm not gonna get emotional about it, but I'm gonna ding my bell to get their attention, wait till they're silent and remind them, you will not speak during the bell ringer. End of story. Like I'm I'm speaking this over you. I'm not being mean about it. I'm not being rude about it. I'm just stating the facts of what's happening. So I think being really clear in your expectations is important so that they don't have this like failure mindset just going into it because they don't even know what they're expected to do. Okay, I think the second thing is super important that comes after this and or really goes alongside this is empowering them with your words and speaking truth over them. This is something I never really realized I did, but my mother-in-law actually, the last time they visited was like, I love how you speak things over them. Like you are such a kind, you know, big brother or that was such a selfless thing to do. You are, you consider others better than yourself, sister, and speaking those things over them. And I think that's important for our high schoolers just as much as it's important for my five-year-old is saying to our students, you can do hard things. I will never push you beyond what I think you're capable of doing. I think back to the help, that book and the movie, like you is kind, you is smart, you is important, you know, that line from that movie, but like saying those things over them, like this is who you are. You can do this. I know you can. And you're going to have to repeat that over and over, just like you repeat the expectation to your students. You know, for me and my two-year-old, that's me saying, you are a big boy. I know you can do this. You can do hard things. I would never push you to do this if I didn't think you can do it. I know you can. And I think you got to do that with your students. Now, the one kicker to this is they have to believe you and they won't believe you unless they feel like you know them. So if you're telling them you're smart, you can do this. And they're like, you don't know me, then that's going to make your words not valuable. And so that's where this all really starts with relationships. Like I would never be a professional potty trainer and potty training people's kids that I don't even know. First of all, I hate potty training. I'm so glad to be done with it. But I couldn't do that because I don't feel like I have those relationships with them. So if you feel like you struggle with student relationships, I'll link in the show notes. One of my virtual professional development courses is about relationships with students, parents, admin, and coworkers. So I cover all of those things, but especially students. You've got to have those relationships first. Now, I know at the beginning of the year, you're like, well, we don't have relationships. We barely know each other. That is true. But I do think this is a habit you can start now of speaking things over them. You can do this. And I'm going to be here with you while you do this. Like, you're not going to be alone in this. We are going to learn hard things. And I'm going to walk you through them every step of the way. So we're going to have clearly communicated expectations and consistently reinforce those expectations. We're going to empower our students with our words by speaking truth over them and speaking really positive things over them. And then third, we're going to hand them successes. So this is one reason, this is such a side note, I did not plan to say this, but this is kind of why I hate pretests. And I don't like when schools force you to give a pretest because I feel like a pretest starts them off with the defeatism. I know the whole point is like seeing what their prior knowledge is and having data that you can compare the pretest to the post test and seeing how they grow and da da da. But it's like, let's just like assume the worst that they are coming in knowing nothing. Like they'd all get a 50 or even like a zero on the pretest and then go from there. Like I think starting off with a pretest can be really scary. Students that have negative classroom experiences that spent many years not in a traditional classroom thanks to the pandemic. They take one of those pretests and they see all these words that are really, really scary and overwhelming. And they're already like, this year is going to be terrible. I don't want to do any of this. I can't do any of this. When it's like, you shouldn't be able to do any of this because it's a pretest. So I think handing them success early is really, really important. I spoke back in episode 141. I'll link that in my show notes 
about some like first day of school tips. So most of you are probably past that point already. Your first day of school has happened, but I also talk about what I teach in my first units for chemistry, biology, physical science, and anatomy. Now, I do think it's important, especially for biology and stuff. I like to start with micro, which is a lot harder than macro and like build outward when your students do have more energy. But I do like to start, I like the first couple of weeks of school to hand them successes. Like let's cover lab safety and equipment, but let's do it in like in a fun and unique way in each class period. Let's go over like the experimental design progress. Let's do process. Let's do an inquiry investigation together. You know, let's do some fun things. Let's have some easy early wins so that they feel like they can do this and they can feel equipped. We're not just giving them like, busy work that's so silly and easy to do, we can do some hard things. Like in chemistry, we do dimensional analysis and scientific notation and sig figs in my first unit, but we're going to do them in a really small way. We're going to build on them. It's going to be very low pressure. We want to hand them successes. So for potty training, we do this too. The process I use is, you know, the first couple of days they're naked just so you can kind of start seeing their patterns, seeing, you know, You're not just constantly doing laundry. It just is easier to do that. And then once they start getting the hang of it, you obviously start putting pants on because we can't have just nudists, you know, forever, unless you live in a nudist colony, which more power to you. But what I found when I started putting the pants on my child was he just started peeing in them because he still was kind of clueless that pee came out of his body. And so then I'd walk in, I'd see him and I'd be like, hey, why are your pants wet? And he looked down and not even realize that his pants were wet. And then he'd say, oh no, yucky pants, you know? And so I started to hand him successes and I would make sure like, we're just going to be pantsless and not leave our house until we get our first good peer bowel movement on the potty. And then we can celebrate that. Be like, you did it. You're awesome. Let's put some pants on now. Starting with a win before we go into the harder learning parts of our day. So I think handing them successes is important. At the beginning of the year with what you're teaching, Don't just dive into like the hardest stuff right away, but then also like in your day. That's why I love having my bell ringers at the start of my class period be open note. I'm not trying to like slam you at the start of the class period. I'm trying to just like make sure we're kind of tracking from the previous day, which is why like it's fine that it's totally open note. So I think handing them successes along the way of the learning process is really, really important. Don't just throw them into the deep end. This is the way we're going to kind of handhold them a little bit to try to build that resilience. My next recommendation is when expectations are not met, we have to revisit them and reiterate them. But again, sans emotion, no emotion here. You have your cells test in biology and the class average is like a 60. And you're like, that's not cool. I'm not good with that. But instead of like ringing the kids out and be like, you guys didn't work hard enough. You got to start studying. You're not going to be successful in this class unless we get this average up to like a 75. I've never had a year of students have an average this low. Instead, we're going to say, hey, my expectation is that we have like a 70% average on every test. So this is far below that. The expectation is that like we're doing what we need to do, you're doing what you need to do, and I'm doing what I need to do to get you to the place that like we have a C average in here. So let's like revisit this. Let's look at what we need to do. Let's talk honestly, meeting with individual students saying, hey, talk with me. How, what did you do to prepare for this test? And seeing what they say and talking to them and kind of saying like, okay, let's talk about, you know, what that could look like differently. I think having those in-person face-to-face conferences with students with or without their parents, you can make that judgment call. Personally, I like to be proactive with parents and bring them in ASAP, which I talked about in last week's episode or the week before. But I would revisit those expectations, ask them those questions. And be clear, again, this is not about you. I think we can get really defeated when our students have a lack of resilience because we we are working so hard. And then for them to not show up on their end, we start to take it personally. Like, well, if they liked me more or if I was more entertaining, if I was doing a better job, if I was a better teacher, no, 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 no. You're making the expectations clear. Your job is to hold the bar and be non-emotional. This is not about you. This is not personal. Let's just ask them some questions. Let's get some clarity on where they're at. Let's make a plan for how we can equip them moving forward. And then let's hand them some little successes to try to build up their resilience a little bit more and try to, you know, boost their up their confidence a little bit more too. And that leads me to kind of my next point. You cannot lower the bar. 
just like I said at the beginning, I have a lot of friends who they get tired. So they decide, you know, so we're all at a birthday party and they're like, well, I don't want to have to take him to the potty 14 times during this birthday party. So I'm going to throw him in the pull up. That's fine. But then I've noticed that those kids are having habits of like they hold it until mom puts a pull up on them when they go to an event and then they're super soaking or pooping in their pull up type thing. You know, I think you have to hold the line and not lower the bar. You know, for me in the potty training process, that means sometimes I have to read eight books to my two year old on the potty while he works out what he's got to work out. Some of us, you know, can't really release a bowel movement on command and that's fine. So my job is to just not lower the bar because I'm tired or I'm I'm losing, I'm becoming apathetic. You know, your job is to not lower the bar, just no matter how they respond, no matter how little resilience they have, do not lo- lower the bar. You hold the line. And then my last thing is you need to have appropriate expectations for your role in this process. Like I said, your job is to be a clear communicator of expectations and consistent communicator over and over. We're going to reinforce those. Your job is to speak truth over your students and empower them with their words. Your job is to hand them successes, to be strategic about your lesson plans and and your grading policy so that they're not just seeing zero, zero, 50%, 50% and like get being like, I can't do this at the start of the unit. Like we want to hand them some early wins, build up their confidence that they can do this in your classroom. Your job is to revisit expectations with students as needed when they don't meet them and do that without emotion because this is not personal. We're just gonna meet here and we're gonna make a plan. We're gonna make a plan together. I'm gonna ask you some questions and we're gonna make a plan together for you to move forward. And in that meeting, I'm gonna empower you with my words. I'm gonna speak truth over you and encourage you. Your role, teacher, is to not lower the bar. You will hold the line. They will never meet the expectation if we keep lowering it or moving it, like I said. And that's your role. Okay, that's a lot of things, but that's it. Here, here's what your role is not. This is where the potty training analogy is going to feel silly, but also clutch because it's a good visual for this. I can do all of these things for my two year old. I can get rid of the diapers and explain to him we're not using them anymore. And this is your potty and this is where you pee and poop. And I'm going to set you on it at natural transitions and I'll read you eight books until they come out. And I'm going to speak truth over you and hand you successes and make it clear when you, you know, have an accident like, oh, that's not where our, our, our poop and pee goes. This is where it goes. Come help me clean this up. I cannot lower the bar, but I cannot literally sit on the potty and pee and poop on behalf of my child. And I cannot physically force my child to pee or poop. Let me tell you something. If someone tries to tell you to go pee or poop on command, it's pretty hard to do, (laughs) especially the bowel movement part. And I know that sounds silly. You're like, of course, like that. But that's what we do to our students. Like, I think some of us fall in the habit of we try to be resilient on their behalf. We try to have the resilience for them. We're trying to literally like carry their bootstraps all the way across the finish line, all the way across the graduation line, all the way to the AP exam or whatever it is. And teacher friend, you cannot do it. My role as a potty trainer and your role as a teacher of these students is to empower and equip them to communicate and hold the line when they start to give up. That is our role. I am to be resilient on their behalf until they strengthen the muscles on their enough on their own but I cannot do it for them and you cannot do it for them either. Okay, I have a podcast episode I did in the spring all about what to do when you care more than your students. And that's a really important listen. So this feel if this feels hard for you to hear, I think you need to also go back and listen to that episode. But that's my biggest encouragement to y'all is like, you may be growing weary of the lack of resilience and the amount of apathy you're seeing in your students. Even now that we're getting to be four, four and a half years post pandemic. But my encouragement to you, teacher friend, is like, hold the line, hold the line, be clear, speak truth and empower, but release the pressure of having to drag your students across the finish line. You may run, run alongside them. You may, you know, flash the flags and set off the fireworks at the end of the finish line, but you may not physically drag them across the line. You cannot build their muscles for them. They have to pick up the weight. 
The only way your muscles get stronger is by bearing weight. So we have to let our students bear some weight here. We cannot bear it all for them. They will never grow strong. And resilience is truly a muscle that they have to strengthen. And unfortunately, there was a period of time that was very critical in a lot of their educational experiences where their muscles of resilience completely atrophied because the world was flipped on its head. So let's recognize that and let's try to let that go and do what we can do and have an appropriate expectation for our roles in this process and let the rest of it be because they have to do it. I hope this encourages you. I hope it equips you. I don't want you to take on this burden for yourself. That's what I really felt like was the prominent emotion in all of the survey responses I got about this topic is teachers just so tired of doing this and trying to do this for their students. And you can't, but there are things you can do. And I hope this episode made those things clear. So if you haven't already left a review for the podcast, I would love it if you would do that. So if you're feeling empowered to equip your students in resilience this year and building that muscle, leave a review for the podcast and seriously check out those other episodes I mentioned, especially if this is an area that you're struggling with too. I will link them in the show notes and you can find those at it's not rocket science classroom.com slash episode 145. All right, teacher friends, that wraps up today's episode. If you're looking for an easy way to start simplifying your life as a secondary science teacher, head to it's not rocket science classroom.com slash challenge to grab your classroom reset challenge. And guess what? It's totally free. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you here next week. Until then, I'll be rooting for you, teacher friend.